Well, we've been talking about generations, reaching the next generation for Christ, reaching children, reaching teenagers. What is our job as a church? And uh, don't you just love kids? They say some of the funniest things, and they are so innocent, and yet they can ask the most penetrating questions. Um, Kim and I worked at a church in Florida before we moved to Georgia, and uh, there's this family. They had a little girl that um, they taught the gospel. And from the time she was little, uh, able to communicate, they told her about Jesus. And they said that Jesus died on the cross for her sins and that he was buried and that he resurrected from the grave and that he was sitting at the right hand of the Father. They would say that uh, to this little girl. She was about four or five years old. And um, so they were questioning her one day, kind of, you know how you do when you have kids that have learned stuff and you kind of want to show off uh, to your friends, and they never do what they're supposed to do when you're trying to show off. You know what I'm talking about. So anyway, they're talking with their friends, and they're like, hey, we're, we're talking to her about Jesus and salvation and so forth. And so they asked her, they said, honey, uh, where is Jesus? She said, uh, he died on the cross, and he rose from the grave, and he is sitting in heaven on the right hand of the Father, and that hurts really bad, right? I mean, so you got to be careful. They can be very literal at times. But as a church, we've got an opportunity here to reassess, to refocus, to make sure that we are in the right uh, lane as far as our mission and our vision goes. And so this is always important to do, to take a moment uh, to just kind of do a checkup, make sure that as a church, we're going in the right direction. And so that's what this series has been about. We want to reach the next generation for Jesus Christ. I'm going to read to you from Psalm 78, and uh, eight verses, verses one through eight. Let's begin reading with verse number one. It says, Oh, my people, listen to my instructions. Open your ears to what I'm saying, for I will speak to you in a parable. I will teach you hidden lessons from our past, stories we have heard and known, stories our ancestors handed down to us. And we will not hide these truths from our children. And this next phrase is what I want to really focus in on as a church. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord. We will tell the next generation. That's our job as a church. That's our mission as a church. That's our goal as a church. That's what we should always be about, telling the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power and his mighty wonders. For he issued his laws to Jacob. He gave his instructions to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children so that the next generation might know them, even the children not yet born. I hope you'll take that to heart. Even the children not yet born. God the Father loves even children who are not yet born. Uh, if you wonder what my position is on abortion, uh, we, of course, believe in the grace of God, that God can forgive of any sin. It doesn't matter. But according to Scripture, God knows you in the womb before you're ever born. You are a person. God's already got plans for you before you are ever born. And so I believe this is another one of those scriptures that backs that up. Even the children not yet born, and they in turn will teach their own children. So each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. Then they will not be like their ancestors, stubborn, rebellious, unfaithful, refusing to give their hearts to God. Well, I want to just take this scripture today and look at some ways that you and I can tell the next generation about Jesus. What is our job? What is our responsibility? And how do we do it as a church? Here's the first thing you must do. You must learn to share your story. Now, everybody has a story. You are an expert on your story. You may not be a graduate from seminary. You may not even have read the entire Bible from cover to cover. You may not feel like you really know that much, but I do know this. You are an expert on your own story. You know what your life was like before you met Jesus. You know what your life is like now, the change that he has made in your life. You know the hope that he's given you. 
you may not be able to defend soteriology. You may not understand what propitiation and expiation means. You may not be able to fully vocalize justification. I hope you can. We've talked about that a lot here. You may not even know those terms. Those are theological terms. But you know your story. You know what God has done in your life. And when you begin to share that, that is the most effective telling of the gospel that there is. The fact is we can get dry facts and talk about that all day. That's interesting to some people, but to most people it is not. But when you begin to tell your story, everybody loves a story. And when you begin to tell your story, it makes all the difference in the world. So share your story. Um, he said, I will teach you hidden lessons from our past, stories that we have heard and known, stories our ancestors have handed down to us. Don't be afraid to share your story. I, I have had my faith strengthened by stories. From many of you, I've observed as being the pastor of this church now for almost 19 years, we started it almost 19 years ago, um, the fact that I've watched many of you grow in your faith. The fact that I've seen so many of you come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. And I hear your story. I hear about what your life was like before you met Christ. And now what God has done in your life. Share your story. That is one of the most powerful things you can do for children and for teenagers. I promise you, your story matters. You may not think you have a very spectacular story. That's okay. But your story matters, and when you share your story with others, it makes a difference. There's a man that, I, uh, that went to the church that Kim and I worked at in Florida before we moved to Georgia uh, about 25 years ago, almost 25 years ago. And um, this man was a, uh, he was a good man. He worked in our church there, and he worked in children's ministry. In fact, his name is Jesse. Jesse worked for over 40 years in children's ministry almost every Sunday without ever missing a Sunday. Incredible. He came to church and all this, but this man was the epitome of faithfulness. Now, God's called you to be faithful, but he's also called you to be fruitful. And this man, he was, he was not one of these guys that had this spectacular story about, you know, he joined a gang when he was three and he was, you know, stealing motorcycles when he was five and, you know, nothing like that. But his story mattered to these kids. And for over 40 years, he came to church every Sunday and he worked with these kids. At his funeral, one of the pastors at that church estimated the number of kids that had been saved over 40 years in Jesse's ministry, that if you line them up in a straight line, that the line would be over one mile long. One mile long. You say, why does that matter? Because the next generation needs to know. You may not feel spectacular. You may not feel like you can make a huge difference, but you can. Your addition matters your contribution matters. Learn to share your story. Here's the second thing. We got to teach the Bible. <clears throat> it says, for he issued his laws to Jacob, and he gave his instructions to Israel. And so we've got to learn how, as a church, to prioritize teaching the gospel. And I can tell you this with full confidence. Our staff does a phenomenal job of that. Uh, Jesse, our, our youth pastor, and Chelsea, our children's pastor, they are committed to sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And here's the commitment we've made. We will teach them the gospel. We will teach them the good news about Jesus if you'll bring them. You got to bring them. That is incredibly important. In teaching them the Word of God, you got to learn that little things matter. Jesse was not some huge celebrity in the Christian world. He wasn't even that well known in our church in Florida there. But Jesse was faithful and he taught the gospel and he loved these kids and it made all the difference in the world. I've watched with excitement how our children and youth ministry are being taught the Bible. Can I just challenge you 
as a family member, as a parent, as a grandparent. Read the Bible with your kids. Partner with them. Talk to them. Pray with them. You don't have to be an expert at it. Look, it, uh, it sometimes feels awkward, okay? Can we admit that? Sometimes you read the Bible or your kids have a question you don't know the answer to. Anybody ever had your kids ask a question you didn't know the answer to? Anybody? Well, you don't have kids. All right, so uh, if you've had kids, you know that they ask questions you don't, have, you don't know the answer to. You don't have a clue. You're just like, shut up and stop asking so many questions. But it's okay if it's awkward. I want you to understand that your kids are going to get more and your grandkids are going to get more out of your efforts and your love and your concerns than they are in a whole year's worth of Sundays. I'm not suggesting that church isn't important. Avalon kids, Avalon youth, very important. You need to, I believe that they're not going to become what God wants them to be without the church. But the church is not the only tool. You have more time than uh, the church does. So spend it wisely with them. Invest in them. Teach the gospel. Teach the Bible to them. And it's okay if it feels awkward. My dad, he's 75 years old. He's a retired pastor. And I've shared the story of my dad many times. How that he was far from God. He was lost. He was an alcoholic. And my mom was praying for him, and he went to church. The first time we ever went to church as a family, I remember that day. I sat on my dad's lap in church, and on that day, he gave his life to Christ and became a follower of Jesus. Well, my dad was one of those guys that he was all in. He was either all or nothing. And once he got saved, he really began to grow, and he would ask the church, uh, the pastor at the church, he'd ask about all these questions, what are you supposed to be doing? And the pastor said, you need to read the Bible and pray with your family. You need to read the Bible and pray with your children. And my dad took that to heart. And we did it every night. Didn't matter where you'd been, how late you got in. And we had this one time, the church that we were in was kind of a country church, and we would have these revivals. And uh, sometimes they would, we'd have revivals services in the morning and in the afternoon and at night. And we'd take a break about 9 o'clock and get something to eat. And we continue to go. On this particular day, we had been in church since about 9 o'clock that morning. We got home about 2 o'clock the next morning, okay? I mean, we had been in church. It, would anybody say that would be enough Jesus for one day, all right? Like 24 hours worth of preaching, right? You know, it was, it was overload, okay? But my dad, God love him, all right? And I love him for this. He was determined that we were going to have prayer and Bible reading. We had just been in 18 hours of prayer and Bible reading, but by God, my dad was like, no, sir, nobody in this household goes to bed until we read the Bible together as a family. So we, he said, all right, well, I'll keep it short. And remember, it was about 2 o'clock in the morning. My dad was reading the Bible, and, and you know, I wish he had read something exciting like, the story of David and Goliath or something like that. But I have no clue what he was reading, and it made no sense. And we didn't care. We were sleepy. We wanted to go to bed. Well, my dad started reading the Bible, and we were fighting, nodding off. And then my dad said, okay, we're going to pray. And he starts praying. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. And Lord, the lumbers and the watermelons and, and the this and this and my dad literally went to sleep while he was leading in prayer. Now, what is my point? It's okay if it feels awkward. It was awkward for him. He had not been a Christian that long, but he knew that he was going to put his full effort into doing what he could to reach the next generation for Christ. And I love him for it. Your kids will love you as well. And learn that as a parent and a grandparent, you can pour into the lives of your children and in the lives of the children of this church. And then here's the third and last thing. You've got to learn to pass the baton. As a church, we've got to learn how to hand off ministry. Now, let me show you how this works. Um, I don't know if you've ever watched, like, the Olympics where they have the 4 by 100 meter dash. You ever watched that? And these guys have a baton, 
and they've got to hold the baton. If they don't hold the baton the whole time, and if they don't cross the line, the finish line, with the baton in their hand, what happens? They get disqualified. They, they, don't be, they can't be counted as finishing the race. But, man, it's fascinating to watch these guys. They, they see the guy coming, and uh, they start, they take off, and they start running. They get up to full speed, and this guy comes right up along beside them and hands that baton off. And then, boy, he takes off, and he do, does it to the next guy, to the next guy, to the next guy, and he runs it all the way across the finish line. My point is this. In passing off a baton, you've got to be doing three things all at the same time. You've got to be running, you've got to be coming alongside somebody, and you've got to be passing it off. And, and let me just say this, as a church, as a Christian, as a believer, listen, you've got to be running. It's your job to stay in the race. It's your job to do what God has called all of us to do, run. Paul said, and the, the Apostle Paul wrote, he said, I'm going to run to win. God wants you to run. So running your race, making sure that you are doing what God has called you to do, making sure that you are contributing in the way that you have been called to. Look, you may not, you may not serve in children's ministry, and that's okay. But you've got to serve somewhere. You say, well, where's the best place to serve, in my opinion? Children's ministry and youth ministry. Highest return on investment. You get to invest in the next generation. You, need to, you get to reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You'll see more people saved in your contribution by doing that than in any other way. However, not everybody's going to do that. I get that. We have other ministries that need to be staffed, okay? Uh, our worship ministry, our tech team, our guest services, uh, and we could go on. Look, the fact is, you need to be running. You run your own race. You run your race, but then if you're going to pass the baton off, you know what you got to do? You got to come up alongside somebody. They don't allow you to throw the baton. If you ever watch one of those races, they don't get within 50 yards of the guy and say, hey, your catch. They don't do that. You know what they do? They run up alongside of him. They run right up alongside of him. And they hand the baton. And here's the point. Who are you coming up alongside of? Are you running your race? Who are you coming up alongside of? Maybe for you it's going to be children's ministry. And you're going to come up alongside of these kids. Maybe for you it's student ministry. And you're going to come up alongside of these kids and make a difference. Maybe for you it's some other area of ministry in our church. But you in a small group are coming up alongside somebody uh, in a ministry. You're coming up alongside somebody. And that is what the Bible calls fellowship. The Greek word koinonia, you know what it means? It means to come alongside of. That's actually what it means. We talk about the word fellowship a lot. And our idea of fellowship is watching football, eating chips, and drinking beer. All right? So, now I'm not saying you cannot fellowship with somebody doing that. But that is not the biblical definition of what fellowship is. Wonderful to hang out. Wonderful to eat together. Our small group does it. We have tremendous meals. We hang out. We enjoy that. But that's not all there is to it. Okay? you got to come up alongside somebody so that you can hand off the baton. How are you handing off the baton? Let me ask you a question. Who have you brought with you in your serving opportunities? If you're working guest services, hey, why don't you invite your neighbor that hasn't even been to our church to come help you serve? You say, what? No, I'm serious. Uh, I've got a neighbor that is the friendliest guy in the world. And I've stopped and talked with him several times. I've said, you have got to come to our church and help us on our greeting team. I said, you're the friendliest person I think I've ever met. And he hasn't come yet, but I'm still working on him. Maybe you need to invite a family member. Maybe for you, one of the best things you can do if you're going to hand the baton off is bring your kid with you. Bring your eight-year-old to serve with you in guest services. Uh, bring your... 13-year-old uh, to serve with you, bring your 15-year-old to serve with you, whatever their age is, I guarantee you that as a parent, if you're running your race, coming alongside of them, and handing the baton off, you're going to make an impact for Jesus Christ. Let me close with this. 
One of the things we've got to learn to do as a church if we're going to pass the baton is to be peddlers of hope. We must constantly pass the baton to the next generation by raising leaders and Christ followers. And if we do that, I want you to see what God promises in Psalm 128. He said, how joyful are those who fear the Lord. He's talking about worshiping God, that you'll have joy. Your life's going to be better. It's a trade up, not a trade down. All who follow his ways, you will enjoy the fruit of your labor how happy and prosperous you'll be. He's talking about what we're talking about, pointing the next generation to Jesus Christ, making sure you're letting them know, doing your part, handing off the baton, coming alongside of, running your race. He said, li listen to the promise to our, about our kids. He said, your wife will be like a fruitful grape, a, a grapevine flourishing within your home, and your children will be a vigorous young olive trees as they sit around your table. Can I say this? When this was written, olive trees, now we don't have the exact kind of olive trees they have over there, but we have some olive trees down here. Olive trees were kind of like this. This is a real olive tree. And they would plant these olive trees. Now the thing about an olive tree is that they didn't immediately produce fruit. They were not the fastest producer of fruit. There are many crops, many trees, many vines that produce food and fruit a lot quicker. But an olive tree, they would plant it. And they had to work on that olive tree for 18 years. Don't you get the picture? They would dig ditches around it. They would water it. They would put fertilizer on it. They would cultivate it. They would prune it. They would trim it and for 18 years. 18 years. Wouldn't you feel like that the first person that ever did this would have given up after about four or five years? Because he's like, man, still no fruit. But once the olive tree has been taken care of, cultivated, come alongside of, watered, fertilized, prayed over, worked over. They begin to bear fruit after 18 years and for 100 years. They never had to do anything else to that tree. For 100 years, that tree would bear fruit. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.